Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar with Carbon Plantations. My name is Matt Reeves, Marketing Manager at Abundance. I'll be the, the your host this afternoon. Um, I'll just wait a few more moments for other other people who might want to join us to to get logged in. Um, so I'll just go quiet for a moment, and then I will be back to introduce the the Carbon Plantations team and get us started. Okay, that looks like all of the initial uh, initial attendees who were in the waiting room have got in, so I will kick us off. As I mentioned, very warm welcome from Abundance to this webinar with uh, Carbon Plantations. Um, as you will have seen on the invite email, they, they raised money with us earlier this year, as, as many of you know, and a new investment will be, will be launching soon from them. So this is an opportunity to hear from them a little bit more about their about their business, what they've been up to since that first fundraise earlier in the year, and a bit of a progress report really from the from the site that you guys helped to help them to fund earlier on this year. Um, the way the session is going to run is I'm going to pass you over to the Come Plantations team in a moment. They'll give a short <coughs> initial initial kind of um, overview and, and, and some information for you. Um, and then there's the opportunity to ask questions. So some of you, thank you very much, have already submitted some some questions um, via email before this session. So we will start off by going through those questions with the team. If you want to ask us or Carbon Plantations a question during the call, you can do so using the Q&A function along the bottom of the page. Just simply stick your stick your question in there and myself and my colleague Justina will will go through and let you know if that question is already on the list or if not, we will we will capture that and put it forward to the team. If someone else has asked a question that you like the sound of and you want to hear answered, just get, you can give that an upvote uh, using the thumbs up and that will let us know that we want to look out for that one. Um, I think that's all of the admin. So without further ado, I will pass across to Nigel Couch, who will take the lead from the Calm Plantation side. So Nigel, over to you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. And we're, we're really excited to share with you um, what we've achieved this year. On the call, I've got with me Scott Hunt, who's the project leader um, uh, and driving force behind um, uh, this particular project, and Matt Ridderford, who's the CEO um, of Carbon Plantations as well. Um, I'm going to start, actually, um, if you don't mind me doing so, with a quote from a recent Friends of the Earth report on why we need more trees in the UK. So excuse me while I read this quote, but I think it's very relevant to today's um, discussion. <coughs> It says, um, you know, we need more trees in the UK, trees for nature, trees to improve soils for farming, trees to hold back floodwaters and moderate heat in our towns and cities, trees to suck up carbon pollution, trees for health, well-being and learning. Less talked about are the trees we need to produce more homegrown timber to use in construction. Less than 20 percent of wood consumed in the UK is homegrown. Um, we'll come on to some of these discussions, I'm sure, and subjects shortly, but I want to just start with that presentation. And that report is available um, on, on the Internet if you want to have a look at it. Um, it's in the public domain. Um, I've just had also join John Perslow, who's our technical director and agronomist um, today as well. I'm sure you'll be asking questions about biodiversity later. I'm going to try and share a screen with you now and just run through a short presentation, um, mainly pictorial, but there's some comments in there we'd like to highlight about what we've achieved we also want to thank you for all your support um, in getting us up and running this year. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, you know, what we've got here is just, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a few slides um, within this just discussing um, uh, the work we've, we've done this year. Um, as you'll be aware, um, you know, this, this is being, um, it's all been done out of Euston Estate in Suffolk. And you can see from the screen that there's um, nine blocks there um, uh, in green. And they're all within about a mile to two miles of each other. Um, they're set up in blocks for, for ease of setting up the infrastructure in the first place. Um, and in total, it's 195 hectares, of which 75% is in Phoenix One, um, which is this fast growing hybrid tree. 15% um, native trees, which we'll also come on to today. And then ten percent in open ground. If you talk to most environmentalists out there, they'll say that a mixture of open ground and woodland 
is the best way or the most optimum way to improve biodiversity. Um, so the first thing we did was, was effectively create a baseline. I'll talk about that quite a lot, but um, in terms of what we have at Euston, we took on the leases in the middle of March and we immediately set to work um, on understanding what we had there. We, we already had an idea, of course, we'd done a number of ground truthing or soil samples. And as you can see from the charts at the bottom here, um, on the left and the right, we're basically in a, in a sandy loam environment. Um, there is some clay in there, but not much. You can look on the left-hand side. This is actually block six, um, which is around 28 hectares uh, in total. Um, so there's 20, 25% clay in there, but mainly sand. The pH is important. Um, sorry, I've jumped on the slide. The pH is important um, because between five and eight is where the trees are at an optimum level. Um, in this particular site or block, it's around seven and a half, as you can see. Um, others are a little bit lower than that. Um, and then the other part of this calculating baseline, which is absolutely critical for, for understanding um, what we're doing in terms of capturing carbon, is to look at um, uh, the active carbon um, in, in the soil and the organic matter. Um, so again, the same block six um, on the left-hand side, I'm talking about left to bottom side um, chart. Active carbon um, tons per hectare is running at less than a ton a hectare. That is incredibly low. That's the starting point we're at. Why is that? Because it's been intensively farmed, you know, successfully, but for generations. Um, and that's not left a lot of active carbon in the soil. The organic matter within it, which is effectively the dead matter that exists within it, which is important for biodiversity, is running between 1% to 2% in this area. It's actually averaging around 1%. That is also very low compared to what you'd expect to see. And both those um, deliverables are going to rise over time. The right-hand side is just, a, just a, the dark blue, if you like, is just where the, fe where the Phoenix one is actually planted in this particular site. So um, we set to work in the middle of March. Um, there was um, some cultivating to be done. We needed to prepare the soils and the land. Um, and that's you know configured by the photograph on the left hand side with the tractor. <laughs> um, but obviously, um, we're taking on soils that have been intensively farmed. So some work needed to be done to break that soil up to allow for the trees to grow uninhibited, if you like, um, going forward. And we'll talk about which root structure later. Fencing, um, clearly very important. We fenced every area here to protect the trees. Um, we've also put in and housed irrigation pipe work. You know, there's a quad on the right hand side. You can see in there black lines of, of um, pipe or lines of, of drip irrigation have gone in. It's important it's a drip irrigation because we're making sure that the water we use is, um, is used in an optimum and a very efficient way. Um, and then obviously we're connecting that water um, from off off the Euston estate itself um, uh, through a contractual arrangement. And we'll come on to how much water we've used later. And in part, we're using it for fertigation as well through those drip lines. So that irrigation is absolutely critical and needs to be in place before we planted the trees. Um, the trees arrived um, after we'd done all the paperwork, of course, for import duties, et cetera, um, and also had DEFRA inspect them, which is very standard by lorry. You can see it on top left hand side. You can see how they're coming in. They're coming in um, um, with jiffies. Um, uh, they're no more than eight to 10 centimeters high. I think there's something like 50,000 um, trees on that particular lorry. They came in in two tranches, um, uh, um, one in early June and one in early July um, to give us time to get the, the optimum tree trees planted, as it were. Um, and we broke up the blocks in order to ensure that we got um, the trees in um, in an efficient way. Um, the other aspect of this is that we we did bring in some planters who were, who were experienced in planting. So all those trees were hand planted. No, no machines were used in, in, in that. And on the bottom right hand screen, you can see that's actually block eight. You can see um, the trees that are in and the height they were in when they were brought in. Um, and obviously you'll be able to see that they're. They've been planted um, in what is a diamond fashion. So it's it's four meters width rows, um, uh, three meters apart in a diamond fashion to give optimum growth potential for the trees. Now, water use in fertigation is clearly important. Um, 
we've used Netafim um, as our preferred supplier um, of irrigation. And they've been incredibly helpful throughout this entire process from day one. Um, and can you continue to work with us through the winter season as we close down the irrigation, for example, and into next year when we reopen? We've, the key data point we want to give you here is that less than 50% uptake of water requirement is what we've what is what has happened in the establishment phase. So I'll just repeat that less than 50% uptake of water requirement. In old money, that's about one acre inch of irrigation water use. That's about 20% of what you would use to grow potatoes. It's really important, I think, that we get this in you know, water is clearly a very key resource. And then smaller, small amounts of MPK, magnesium, and zinc have been have been introduced to ensure both good husbandry and also strengthen the root structure. And the root structure is critical. And you'll see an example of that later on um, in this in this presentation. We've also put in place, and again, I've taken block six on the bottom, bottom left hand side just for just to, to confirm conform with what we've done earlier there. Um, there's three fields there, big field, wireless and big hodner. Again, 28 hectares. There's 35 monitoring sites on there. Um, there's 167 monitoring sites in total. They're all 15 meters by 15 meters. They have 18 trees in them. Um, there's 2% of the project that's monitored. This has been agreed with the Forestry Commission uh, as part of our environmental impact assessment process, and they will remain in place. And it's obviously part of our own data gathering as well. Um, you know, average height, 750 millimetres in year one, which we're absolutely thrilled with. Um, some are bigger, some are smaller. That depends on the size of the tree that comes in when they come in. Um, and then we will technically cut some trees um, in the spring of 2023, which might lead to some questions later on, but we could talk about that or to that to that discussion. But the important thing is you should be aware of is, you know, we've got these monitoring sites very much in place as you'd expect. On the right hand side, that photograph was taken, I think, early September, and it shows you that the trees are progressing very well. That's actually in block two, I believe. Um, coming on to the native woodland, it's a very important part of our project. It's 15% of the land that we're putting in. It's actually 33,000 trees that we're going to be planting in December this year. Um, you've actually got on the left-hand side, for those of you that are interested, the mix of trees that we're putting in at Euston, um, you know, from oak through hazel, et cetera, down to beech at the bottom. That's all been pre-agreed with the Forestry Commission and is sensitive to the local environment. There's already woodland on, in, in place at Euston and a number of these plantations, if you like, of, of native trees will be around the existing woodland. Um, so again, sensitively um, promoted for the for the local environment. And really importantly, we're using a company called Rhymer Trees, which literally sit in the middle of these plantations. So it's very locally supplied. It's very important, um, you know, from that. So um, the middle photograph there is just of the trees which we're, we're going to be picking up in the next couple of weeks um, which have been grown from source at Rhymer trees over the period of this year so uh, there will be some questions I'm sure around biodiversity uh, and the impact on that that photograph there I've actually you can't see the person that's holding it that's not for any particular reason it's just that we had to get that wording in but you can see that is one of our poorer trees I mean it's a smaller tree it's it was sitting at, at, in a corner of a field but look at the root, look at the tap root there. That is one and a half meters in length. Um, and that just gives you an example of fact of what the tree's been up to. If you think back to the previous slides, which I'll try and do now, look at that where they were when they came in, to, you know, in form for the lorries at that, at that height, we're now getting that root formation. Um, the root formation is absolutely critical, um, not only for the health of the tree, but also for biodiversity. It's breaking up the soil. Um, intensive farming practices lead to soil degradation, as we said in this particular slide. Um, and over time, organic matter will increase um, from this. There's a strong argument out there that as you increase organic matter, even as this is by 0.1%, you're increasing the amount of carbon that's going to be held in the soil. And what does that do? It holds more water and it improves the biodiversity as well and, and develops a much greater soil stability. So we're early into this journey, um, but we're already seeing some interesting developments on that. Um, and, you know, the soil improvement um, compared to where it was before with intensive um, with intensive farming is is critical to us and will be and to be monitored closely. Finally, just a sort of quick summary before we move on to Q&A. Um, 
we've hired an operational management team within that with over 20 years experience. Um, they're on site five, seven days a week, um, checking um, the infrastructure, for example, which I hadn't mentioned, those sheds that we talked about earlier on, they're run by solar panels. They're remotely controlled. Um, you know, we know exactly every drop of water we've put onto this plantation this year. And we, we can continue to monitor that as we reopen that in the um, in ne next spring. And we've successfully planted 116,000 Phoenix One trees this year, thanks to your support. That's a 1% attrition within that to be expected. It's been an, an unusually hot summer, the hottest on record. Um, and we've also got that infrastructure now in place, which will um, need to be maintained, of course, but will last through the duration of the project and fence erected accordingly um, using creosote wood, um, which again, will be long lasting. 33,000 native trees are gonna be planted by the end of 2022. And most importantly, when we come on to things like carbon offsets, et cetera, we've created, we've developed, and we've got a baseline of active carbon measured from year zero on the project. So that is just a little bit of summary for you. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of color to help with some Q&A, um, and then we can open it up. I'll put this back to Matt now. I'll just um, stop sharing so that we can then go on to um, any questions you, which you may have. That is great. Thank you very much for that intro, Nigel. And lots of nice detail there and also thank you uh participants for your questions so far you'll have seen that the garden plantations team have been in amongst your questions giving you uh, responses on those where we can so we could proceed i think and I get into the q a now nigel um as i mentioned earlier on there were a few questions that that um investors sent in ahead of time so i'm going to start with those and those some of those themes are are themes that have been raised in the live q a First of all, so first question, a slightly broader one, I think um, we, had, we had a few questions in from investors kind of highlighting, I suppose, the importance that we all feel that any kind of plantation of, that, of this sort should play a positive additive role in the local environment. Um, so I'm keen to hear uh, how your plantations have been designed to 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 fit in with the with the local existing local environment. Yeah, so I think what we'll do is if I can pass that question across to Scott um, and then we can go on to, to any other questions you may have. Scott, do you want to answer that one? Could you ask, ask, ask the question again, Matt? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, no problem. So the question is uh, really around how you ensure your plantations play a positive additive role in the environments in which they are situated rather than in some other commercial plantations. A criticism can be that they 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 take from that environment rather than playing a positive role in that environment. So it's really your response to how your approach tries to mitigate that issue. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for previous investment as well. Um, so all of our designs uh, went through our forestry consultants um, and they make these designs as per UK forestry standards. So we go through a process which is called Woodland Creation Planning Grant, stages one and then stages two, and that ensures the quality of design ticks all the current Forestry Commission standards. Um, and most of those uh, are all about net biodiversity gains now. So it's all about gain in every single area. So this is quite an exhaustive process. It took us over two and a half years from start to finish to get to the finished article. So we go from the planning grant stages one, then it goes into two, which is a lot more detail. Um, we then have to go out uh, to, to the public and what we call stakeholders of interest. So people like the Environment Agency, uh, the RSPB, the local authorities, the Archaeological Society of, of Euston, uh, the Ramblers Association of of West Suffolk, you know, all, every single stakeholder that has an interest in the design of the plantation has an input. So we then go through that scoping mechanism, uh, which is then fed through into something called an environmental impact assessment, which is essentially planning permission uh, for, for, for our trees. Um, and that environmental impact assessment is then judged on the, the net gains that those uh, woodland creation has on the local environment uh, by working with the local environment to make sure it, it absolutely fits into that. So what is right for one piece of land may not be right for another. Um, once we achieved our environmental impact assessment, which is the planning permission 
uh, we then had another round of design changes from the Forestry Commission's own landscape designer uh, to tweak. So we lost another acre or two, for example, uh, for extra uh, plantings around some existing pits, uh, some field margins, um, and, and just a slightly different approach to how the aspects would look from footpaths or from public roads. So um, the, the short answer is a lot of work has gone into and a lot of input has come into the design process from every conceivable stakeholder you can imagine. Um, and I had hair when I started that process. Um, so um, anyway, we finally got there in the end and we're delighted with the design results. That is a um, very good answer. Very good answer, Scott. Thank you very much for that. Um, of course, if anyone has any follow up questions to any of these initial responses from carbon plantations, please do. I know some of you have already been doing this, but please do add those into Q&A and I will circle back on those um, when the opportunity presents. Thank you, Scott. So um, the second question was really around that we received was really around the role that you think that woodland plantations like this can have in helping the UK essentially deliver on its carbon reduction targets. Um, it's a big topic, of course, how we're going to get to to net zero or whatever way you choose, you would like to frame that. So I suppose the question, Nigel, is how do you guys feel that your approach can contribute in that context? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Obviously, it's it's critically important to us, um, the carbon capture that we're that, that's happening, you know, on the plantation from day one, in fact. Um, if you remember back to the slides, you'll probably notice that the leaf structure um, looked a little bit unusual, but they were very, they're very large leaves. Um, and if you think about that, you've effectively got natural solar panels. It's a fast growing hybrid trees we've previously discussed. Um, that means that um, from a perspective of capturing carbon, this is this this particular hybrid tree is optimum at, at bringing the carbon capture forward. Um, we're not in a position clearly to solve um, all of the UK's carbon reduction targets. That's not our role, but we are a brick in the wall, if you like, in supporting um, uh, those carbon reduction targets. This particular tree, um, as I said, will probably capture something like 10 times what a, what a, a natural mixed woodland will do in, in its lifetime. And it will be, and it will come in in the, for, in the forward years as well um as the tree grows um and as those leaves get get to work um capturing that the the solar radiation that's coming in and clearly this summer that's been um very pertinent given what's been occurring with climate um in the uk so you know we're very confident um that, that the uh, this particular tree can sit very well alongside existing trees um and other attempts to to capture carbon and it will and it will bring that carbon capture forward and not to the end of the project understood thank you nigel that's that's clear obviously it's a it's a hot topic for a lot of people so good to hear your good to hear your perspective on that thank you um the next question is about is a kind of a biodiversity one i suppose mm -hmm. um I, I live up in Scotland and I live near lots of large conifer plantations that are just up the road from me. So this subject is close to my heart as well. Um, we've had a few questions in from people talking about, you know, the the creation of, of what you might describe as monoculture environments uh, by commercial plantations. That might be a stereotype that exists around this type of around this type of forestry. So really keen to understand how your approach differs when it comes to not creating the, the the challenges you might say that come along with with monoculture forestry yeah i was going to ask scott again actually if if, if you could um give some thoughts on that yes it's a you know thanks for the question it's it, it, it's a good question um it is something we wanted to avoid um under uk forestry standards um a monoculture is something that's um anything more than about 70 percent in, in any area. Um, so we can only plant up to 70% uh, of, of a single species tree. Um, by doing so, we also have to have open ground um, and native, uh, native species as well. So um, all of the plantations as a, as a block uh, are, are under the UK FAS rules uh, to that. Um, when you look at a software plantation, as Matt mentioned up in Scotland, the, the biodiversity gain of that monoculture is, is greatly reduced because there's no light in that plantation. If you look underneath a conifer plantation, you'll just see a bed of needles. There's no flora, there's no fauna, there's no light. 
um, it's not really doing a great deal to increase the biodiversity. Yes, it produces softwood, um, but only does it once. With our plantation, obviously, the density is about half of that of a plant of a softwood plantation. Um, and so they're, they're much greater spaced out. We're planting uh, a woodland pasture, essentially. And, and the light is very dappled uh, with our trees because they have, a, they have a relatively big leaf, but not that many of them when they're pruning correctly. Um, so it does allow light to come into the, uh, the, um, the plantation uh, in order that the wildflower and the insect and pollinator mix that we are putting in or, or have put in in certain cases um, can benefit greatly. So um, the monoculture question is something that we, we didn't want to do. And, and thank goodness for that, because we haven't. It's a good it's a good answer, Scott. And I think it's a, it's certainly a challenging a challenging area, isn't it, in terms of how you can come up with different solutions, different novel solutions to try and deal with some of the inherent challenges within within the industry. So I think that's I think that's excellent to hear. Um, the, the the following question, I suppose, is kind of related to that, which is really to do with biodiversity and how your plantations take the promotion of biodiversity into account in their in their design and also within the within the sites you've you've selected for both the one that we've already funded earlier this year and the and the future sites you're looking at so so nigel it's kind of over to you on the the, the big b the biodiversity question are oh, you on mute there nigel i'm good sorry about that um i'm going to introduce john at this stage um uh who's obviously he's our technical director and agronomist and has got uh, a lot of experience in looking at soils in the east of England. Um, uh, so, um, John, over to you. Um, we've uh, we've had a, a, a biodiversity um, dearth in a lot of the um, open farmlands that we've had for many many years, and uh, we've got the uh, the pleasure and pri privilege of being able to adjust that with not only um, a fast growing tree, but we've also got an understory uh, and a mixed environment. So the more we can complicate this environment, the more biodiversity we'll, that we'll have. And so we'll, we're, we're looking at um, a carbon increase in the soil. And from that micro uh, organisms will increase. And um, a lot of the fungi um, underground are, are carbon and rich. And so we'll be building the soil up. And from there, insects um, uh, will, will increase. Um, and I've always believed that insects are the glue of ecosystems. And I'm so looking forward to watching this whole project um, increase in, in bio, biodiverse value. I've done a few pitfall traps to start with, and uh, on the on the in, initial um, uh, look, there was very little uh, uh, that uh, that they caught, and um, I was hoping to get some more done, but the rain has uh, has prevented that. So next week I'll be doing some more to see where we are in the autumn, but we've we've got a fantastic um, opportunity to improve locally um, in a mass uh, diverse, uh, an increased biodiversity. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I think it's, I think it's critical for, for, for the, for the kind of overall impact of these plant for these plantations that you guys are taking, taking that element of things so seriously. So that's really, that's really, really great to hear. Um, okay, Nigel, the next few questions are, are more in the quick fire category. Uh, so after a few high level ones, uh, we've got a few slightly shorter ones that have come in. So I'll pitch these to you and, and the answers to these ones may well be may well be quite simple. So question one was just simply are the are the trees able to reproduce naturally on the plantation? Scott, do you want to make a couple of comments on that? Yes, yeah. Um... It, it was a concern of the Forestry Commission, and so it's formed a, a big part of the conditions of consent. Um, and so um, we have to adhere to those conditions in terms of monitoring. Um, the answer is no, um, they are infertile um, in the same way that a, a horse and a, I think it's a horse and a donkey make an ass. 
that the ass can't reproduce. And it's the same thing with a hybrid. It's the same principle. Um, so, yes, after nine years of, of trials, currently there's, there was no inflorescence, which is flowers, or infrutescence, which is seeds, uh, none of which have been produced. Okay, thank you, Scott. And I did. I wasn't thinking we'd have the word "ass" on this uh, webinar. So nice, <laughs> nice work of in, nice work of introducing that. <laughs> the legis legitimate use of the word "ass." Excellent. That's what we like to. That's what we like to hear. Okay, thank you. Um, so the second kind of question was really that we had a few different ones in from investors ahead of time, which really were talking a little bit about sort of how, how you guys make money from from doing this so what the what the revenue streams are involved for for the on the plantation uh for you guys so uh, nigel back to you yeah so i think what i'll do is i'll introduce matt at this stage i think if i could um just to answer that that particular question over to you matt hello everybody um thanks for for dialing into the uh, call today um our, our revenue streams are fairly simple i've been uh typing away uh, already answering questions about carbon credits that's one of our sources and then also we will be uh, generating revenues from harvesting timber uh, so it will be mentioned at some point probably has already um but our our tree can be coppiced so it will regrow so over our 35 years we'll get a number of different harvests out of the tree um, we will also thin the plantation as well which I've seen has come up in one of the Q and A's as well um, so around the six year mark we will take out every other tree to allow uh, it's it's bigger brother to spread its shoulders out as the tree matures um, over time and then from that point onwards we'll do every other tree we'll do sort of a, a 10 10 year cycle um, of harvesting timber um, the carbon credits are very interesting uh, all of we have a pipeline of projects uh, which we're developing and rolling out um, we've we've been very successful in the Woodland Carbon Guarantee Scheme, uh, where we uh, auction, we, we go into a reverse auction and we gain a carbon price, um, which is guaranteed by the UK Treasury. And, and that's been very fundamental to, uh, you know, abundances due diligence and, and in investigating the certainty of the revenues which are coming in. The prices which we've got for our uh, for the for the projects which we're looking at at the moment are around about twenty pounds a ton, so there's a bit of a premium there to uh, current voluntary market prices. Um, then there's additional carbon on top of uh, the carbon which is in the carbon guarantee scheme, which would either go into uh, the woodland carbon code or into into voluntary schemes as well. Um, there's also developments within the carbon markets. We were quite integral with working with the Forestry Commission to uh, to develop the methodology, which is is if you like the rules of the carbon, uh, which is el eligible into the Woodland Carbon Code and into the Woodland Carbon Guarantee Scheme. And and so as as we go through time, we're expecting that scheme to develop and take into account uh, you know more potential carbon as we go through time. So, for example, there's been a consultation out recently where um, the Woodland Carbon Code uh, credits might be eligible to the UK ETS, which is the compliance trading scheme for the UK. That would mean that, you know, supply is controlled um, and, and there's also a carbon tax, uh, which the UK government runs. And so therefore the prices of those credits are around <clears throat> 60 to 80 pounds a ton. So our revenue stream is developing as we as we go through with the project. Um, obviously, uh, the Polonia tree hasn't been sold into the UK, but what drives timber prices is the transport costs and its uses. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get onto uh, that point a bit later on. Um, so I won't answer that question now. Yeah, that, that's correct, Matt. We, we've got some other questions in and around the kind of the sort of timber you guys are going to be producing and the potential end uses for that timber. So yeah, good call. We'll uh, we'll cycle back on. We'll cycle back on that one a little bit later on. Okay, th thank you, Matt. Um, uh, a, a few more short ones before we get back into some longer ones. Um, a few investors, a few in the chat today, and a few uh, beforehand have asked if you guys would be able to arrange a visit at some point in the future uh, to, to one of your sites. Would that be something you guys could would would consider 
yeah, I'll, Scott, I'll leave that one with you if I may. Yeah, very happy to. Um, you know, I, th I think the best thing is to pick the most interesting time to visit so you can get the most out of it. Um, we'd be delighted to host host you all. Um, I'm thinking May, somewhere like that, sort of late spring. Um, I see John's agreeing, so that's probably a good time for the from the growing perspective. But um, yeah, we want to make it interesting and also no one likes the rain. Um, so I would say May is a good a good idea and then if there's a follow-up as well i would push it as late as we can into october so you can see the difference between what happens in may and then what's uh, what's happened over the the growing season to the end of super october super duper thank you very much scott we'll take you up on that so um abundance investors look out for some details of that a bit nearer the time thank you um Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that, gentlemen. So moving moving on to some some slightly bigger topics again after those quick fire ones. Um there's been a few questions in the live chat and there were some questions beforehand which really related to to the timber you guys are intending to produce. So the 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 Polonia wood itself, what what applications might it have, how that might differ to other wood that's produced by, you know, conifer softwood plantations. Um because obviously a key part of this is making sure the carbon remains locked up for for the long term. And so, of course, the, the use of the timber is important. So I suppose there is a there are a few questions that are around this topic. So what 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 is the wood to be used for? What sort of purposes does it have? How confident are you guys that there is a there's a market for for that for that timber in this country? And I suppose kind of relate kind of related to that. Um, is there a uh, do you sorry i'm just trying to read this question that came in just before so excuse me i've tripped over myself there no i think those were the main things so the main things were what what can the timber be used for and what purpose does it have how does that differ perhaps from timber produced by other plantations in the uk and how confident are you on the commercial side that you can you can find uh, a market for this for this wood nigel okay so um let me let me try and answer that one um and clearly it's very important to the project um its own way alongside carbon offsets um i mean the first thing i'd say is that the uk is the world's second largest net importer of, of by value of forest products behind china in fact um and obviously quite a lot of that is coming from eastern europe um into into the uk so um you know there is a you know there's a need for locally produced timber but it's got to be sustainable timber and that's where we're coming from this is absolutely all about sustainable timber um the way that we're thinking about this from a timber perspective and we're already having discussions with and working alongside academics in this field um um also uh, timber sawmills um and um uh, building industry experts as well um is that we know that we know the tree can be the timber can be used for furniture uh, for cladding uh, around sheds, for example, um, less so for um, structural work. Um, it was not going to replace oak, for example. Um, however, um, you know, whether timber is going to be very useful, I think, is probably in the laminated board area. We've already had some very um, interesting conversations in, in that area um, and um, some initial contractual discussions you know, around that um, at, at, at very high level, of course. Um, around, around the use of it in laminated boards. Why would we say that? Because obviously the, you know, the timber can be used um, uh, with other timber products um, in combination. Um, and then when, if you consider what's going on, certainly across Europe, um, but also in the UK over time, wood is, is it likely to be used more rather than less in, in building of building going forward. Um, and Polonia is going to have a role to play, um, or Phoenix One in this case, sorry, is going to have a role to play in that um, in the years to come. Um, so we're already on that journey. We already started it well before we started the project. So um, and we'll have more to say about that in the future. Um, so that, that, that would be my thoughts on that. Um, I don't that know. Makes that make, Go on. That makes sense. No, I was going to say. Um just for just for those of us who are less familiar um i mentioned the the big software plantations up the road from me uh, i think someone in the live chat said that though that that would tend to be used i don't know this to be true so i'm going to put it to you guys that would tend to be used for more short term rather than the more long-term purposes that you guys are, are describing so i don't know if one of you guys is more in the know uh perhaps you can just kind of outline outline for me perhaps and for us the the kind of differences in what you can use a hardwood product like like the product you guys are producing versus the 
the the more softwood output that you might get from a from a conifer plantation yeah so the the, the key point about which i didn't it's, it's a very good question about the key point about about this particular wood is it doesn't um stress under extreme heat or cold um and so you know if you and i was you know this is a, a side point but you know i've got colleagues that are working uh as timber merchants and you know they obviously they if you go to a timber merchant you'll see there's quite a lot of wood left outside and it'll be softwood um in the heat of the middle of the summer here in early july they lost 10 percent of their supply because that softwood just effectively warped and then didn't go back into shape afterwards under the heat um this particular timber doesn't do that um uh it, it doesn't warp like you would have a softwood um it is lighter um uh than than other hardwoods but that's a benefit as well because it can be it's it's therefore more flexible to be used uh, in terms of uh in terms of products either in buildings or furniture etc so i don't know if that helps answer the question matt yeah yeah it does i mean i mean in, in my head i kind of understand that you have hardwood and you have softwood but i sort of didn't really kind of appreciate the, the reason for the difference I, the, the 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 response to extreme conditions makes sense as a as a reason for the difference so yeah that's that's very useful for well, me. The, yeah. yeah yeah the interesting thing i would say is that hardwood actually our hardwood could actually replace some softwood in fact mm -hmm. um, um used in um in the industry so um purely simply because it's a light understood understood thank you very much that's very useful so there's just a couple more questions um that we should cover so the the next one is about something i don't know about personally so it's over to you guys to to remark on whether this this assertion is indeed the case uh, and if if so what you what you do about it so um an investor has commented that they've seen some evidence that tree planting activities can can dry the land which can have the effect of you know, releasing carbon, not storing the carbon so effectively in the land. Now, I don't know if that's the case or not, so it's over to you to comment on whether that's something that you guys have come across, and if so, how does your approach mitigate that that uh, situation? I think, so I think probably I'll ask, I'll ask John, actually, if you could answer that, um, that particular question, um, given his knowledge of soils um, in this part of the world. Um. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. That's a, uh, a, a really good question. Um, the uptake of moisture will be quite um, quite large. But what we're expecting is that we won't be losing a lot of that moisture. Um, a 1% increase in organic matter will increase the water holding capacity of 75,000 litres a hectare. Um, a lot of soils at, at present are um, bare over this time of year. And um, we see massive amounts of uh, soil wash into, uh, into the roads and then the rivers. Um, our plantations will be solid and um, will have enough ability of using that water. So it's not only rainfall, will be make it in, into effective rainfall. So the sink from our plantations will be greater than an agricultural soil. Um, we, have, we have the ability of putting some moisture water in, but we're expecting over the time uh, to be able to increase the water locally and held within our plantations. So I understand the question, um, but we think from what we what we're looking at going forward, this will be mitigated a lot by the uh, the way that we actually maintain and store the water in our own plantations. Thank you very much, John. That is that is that's a very interesting response. It's an interesting question, as you say, lots of things to consider when you're putting uh, a plantation like this together. So really good to hear your thought process that that's behind it. Um, we're reaching the end of the towards the end of the Q and A now. Just a couple more questions. There's one more from the set that were received ahead of time, and then there is another additional kind of question that is, has come in from a few investors during the the call, which which I'd like to pick up with you guys directly. Um, 
the the final kind of preloaded question if you want to call it that from from investors really was around the the balance of this project versus agricultural output so obviously there's an awful lot of discussion rightly about food security and the need to produce food locally and obviously the the intention here is to create plantations on formerly intensively farmed land so how do you guys square that off in terms of impact what are your thoughts on the 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 balance there between producing food on the one hand and uh schemes like, like this on the other it's an interesting question nigel uh over to you absolutely it's very interesting and very important as well um to air this discussion um i'm gonna ask john to answer this i'd, I'd just say first of all that obviously we are i didn't mention this in the opening presentation we're using marginal um, agricultural land um you know as prescribed um by our own ethos and, and attempts to to grow the woodland but i'll pass this question on to john given his his um agronomist background well thank you very much for the question it's a, again a huge question and yes we will be uh taking some of the marginal land out of production a lot of the land that we're we are using is not suitable for vegetable uh or potato production um so uh, the the land that we are using has been into maize for biodigesters or wheat or orchid rape, but most of it is not vegetable uh, land. So on the on the marginal side, we're not actually um, influencing food production that much. But uh, the question itself is a fantastic one. And I'd like a couple of hours to answer it, please, Matt. Uh, I, I will. I, I will ask you to to curb your enthusiasm to a couple of minutes, <laughs> if at all possible, John. I mean, I, I would also add, if I may, Matt. Obviously, we discussed this earlier on, but you know, we, we, you know, we've used less than fifty percent of the water we expected to use this year, and that's in the you know the hottest summer on record. Um, uh, that means that water goes somewhere else um, on the estate, um, and it's mm. used elsewhere in food production. So. Um, and because we because we've got drip irrigation in place as an infrastructure, um, it means that that water is absolutely targeted as well. So I think it's important to understand that the resources that we're taking up around the growth of this plantation are actually pretty minimal compared to the growth of um, you know the development of of, of 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 other products and some of the animal feed, um, as as JP alluded to. Understood. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and the, the final question is one that's come in during the call. A few different people have asked this question. I know you guys have responded back directly to some uh, or to all, in fact, to the questions that have come in during the during the call. But there was one that a few different people asked in different forms. So I'd just like to to put it to you guys for a more for a more kind of collective response, which is really about your kind of mitigations or plans to cope with extremes of of weather, of temperature uh, during the, the plantation's lifetime. So how do you insulate or to or protect your 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 plantation in the event of those extreme weather events which we we don't we don't want them to be becoming more likely but we 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 kind of know that that's the case so it's really your observations on how you guys deal with that or how you guys are prepared for that yeah i think scott i think i might ask you to answer that one yeah um again obviously you know when you when you start planning projects such as this you have to look at worst case scenarios because that's what uh that's what you're based on and and at the moment um you know climate is obviously front and center with everyone everyone's concerned um in in terms of heat i mean we had two days of 42 degree heats and we were desperately worried um about the tree you could see it visibly flagging um but then we 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 managed to irrigate uh in the in the cool if you could call 28 degrees at night cool um we irrigated them in in the evening um so there was only two days where we thought that we were um you know we were not in any danger uh but certainly we were being very mindful of what was going on and you know we, we have to look the same varieties grown in southern spain so 40 40 degree heat is very commonplace for weeks and months on end down there so uh we we were being overly protected but you would do with your with your baby um and so so on that front is fine in terms of the the other extreme the cold um i think last year in in germany there were 
sustained temperatures of minus 18 degrees, I think, don't quote me on that, but somewhere around that. Um, and you'd have to have three, four weeks of sustained temperatures such as that to, to do anything to the cell structure of a tree that's currently dormant at that time of year anyway. Um, so we're not worried. And, and even if there was a problem, we're, we're insured. So um, yes, the, the extreme temperatures thing is something that uh, we, we obviously pay attention to, but only in the, only in the odd event. That is a good answer. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, and that has brought us to the end of our Q&A list. Really good collection of questions. And thank you to everyone who submitted a question either before the call or on the call. A few people asked about when the next investment offer will be available in abundance. Um, uh, Matt, I know you answered that directly, but I, I will say we're, in, we're currently in the process of going through the, working through the due diligence on that. So we're expecting that to be be to be launching in the in the coming weeks um and of course i know a lot of you have already supported carbon plantations in their first offer earlier this year so there's nothing else for me to say other than to say the the, the copy of this recording will be uh collated after the session and we'll share that as an update on the on the carbon plantations investment page that you can have a look at um nigel earlier in the call alluded to some youtube videos we'll make sure we share the links of those as well and a few people have asked for the link to that friends of the earth report you were eloquently quoting from at the very top of this call nigel so i'll grab the link from you after this and we can we can make Absolutely. sure that gets that Absolutely. gets circulated as well um before we close, Nigel, anything or any of the rest of the carbon plantations team would like to say before we sign off? No, I, I don't think there's anything. Obviously, I'm you know talking on behalf of the team here. We, we're just thrilled with what's happened this year in terms of uh, the growth of the tree and the development, the establishment, what we're trying to achieve for the environment as well. And obviously, we're you know very thankful for you, for your support as investors um, on our journey. Um, and we look forward to updating you further um, in the coming months. That's great. Thank you, Nigel. And on behalf of everyone at Abundance, thanks very much for joining us on this session. And thank you very much, Carbon Plantation team, for, for joining us. It's been a great session and uh, I wish you all a good afternoon.